This is Tabby, and you're listening to the Modern Life Podcast. Today, I'm tackling and the sequel with special guest Diane New, president of the Gilbert Blythe Appreciation Society and the world's most renowned expert on hot dads. Diane is the creator of the Shape by Stories podcast, where she interviews a different guest each episode about books that are special to them. She's also the co-host of the Thing About Austin podcast. You can find her on Instagram at Shape by Stories Diane and at the Thing About Austin. I encourage you to check out the show if you're curious about Jane Austen, of course, but also the Regency period in general. Every episode has so much fun and informative content, like how one went about obtaining a divorce in Austen's time or the significance of portraiture in upper class families. And now let's get on with the show. It'll be three years before I finish medical school. Even then there won't be any Dun Sunburst or Marble Halls. I don't want sunbursts or marble halls. I just want you. Welcome back to the Modern Life Podcast. I have Diane here with me. And Diane, what's your modern thought for us today? Okay, so really the thing that I am, I feel like using the most these days is audiobooks, which feels like a very, well, feels like both modern and old school, right? Because now we use them like through our phone and whatnot. But I'm just like so grateful for audiobooks. It's what gets me through the day sometimes, just having that in the background. And I was realizing that part of why I love a good audiobook, like especially when the narrator is just so on point, is because it's basically like you're listening to a really good adaptation. Like it's like you're listening to a really good film adaptation. I could see that. Do you have any like favorites right now that you can think of that you can recommend to people? I mean, no, of course not. (laughs) Not off the top of my head. (laughs) Sorry. Um, (laughs) I I feel like I crank through I crank through them so quickly that. Okay, just a humble bragging over here. Uh, No. Listen, I'm not like over here, like listening to War and Peace or whatever, you know, <laughs> it's like a lot of, a lot of cozy mysteries and, and that sort of thing. But I, I think just so much of it depends on the narrator. So like, if you're somebody who reads romance, you, you know, like, a book can be kind of whatever. But if the narrator is Rosalind Lander, I'm just like, yes, I'm here for all of this. So <laughs> she, she can just elevate it all. Um, and that's just one example. I mean, there's so many great audiobook narrators out there. But on the flip side, you can also tell when you get one where you're kind of like, mm, for example, I just, I was listening to Anne of Avonlea and the narrator, she made Gilbert sound like he was from the Wild West. Like he had a drawl, kind of, he was a cowboy. I don't yeah. know. It was very bizarre. Yeah. And when you posted that in our book club, like multiple people, including me, were like, oh, we know exactly the one <laughs> you're talking about. Because she does like multiple Montgomery books and she always gives everybody a southern american accent for some reason it was just i don't know why it was why. Just so distinctive it was, <laughs> yeah yeah no that's a good one thank you so much yeah um that's all i'm doing is audiobooks as well so <laughs> my modern thought is i don't know if you've heard of this but it's this new app for apple smartwatches to help with nightmares it's called nightwear oh okay it sounds like the stuff of nightmares yeah. but okay <laughs> No, it's so it was designed by the son of a war veteran who had um, his dad had trouble sleeping. He was afraid to sleep, which is apparently very common. And then uh, that can often turn to substance abuse just to get through, you know, a, a night of sleep. And he actually got the idea from service dogs because I did not know this, but they nudge or lick sufferers of PTSD until they stop thrashing in their sleep. No. Um, so dogs are perfect as always. Yeah, but dogs <laughs> are perfect angels as we knew. The watch works with your heart rate and recognizes when you're in distress, I guess, and emits vibrations that soothe you but don't wake you so you can stay in the REM cycle. I don't know how it works. It's, I mean, it's like tech magic. Yeah, this sounds like magic. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The FDA has given clearance for the device to be distributed and there's currently a wait list because you do need a prescription or something to prove that you need it and it's not just some, you know, bro getting the latest gadget. So it's meant to be for other war veterans and i just thought there was some good news i saw and i just thought that was really lovely that he designed that to help his father that's so interesting i love that you're like let me talk about this really cool and meaningful tech and i'm all i like audiobooks (laughs) 
but your modern thought was actually related to the topic that we're going to be discussing today. <laughs> That's what I was trying to go for. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're going to be talking about the later Anne books using the 1987 movie sequel as our jumping off point with a special focus on Anne of the Island. In this story, Anne Shirley leaves Green Gables to attend school, or in the case of the film, be a teacher. Especially important to Anne's journey is her childhood friend Gilbert Blythe, who finally confesses his love for her, only to be turned down. Another suitor pursues Anne, though when he proposes, she becomes to realize that she has loved Gilbert all along. Gilbert and Anne eventually end up together after three long books, as she famously tells him that she doesn't want sunbursts and marble halls, she just wants him. So, you have been a long-time fan of these books, you grew up with these books, but I made you kind of watch this film in its entirety. And because the actors had grown up so much and they weren't suitable for a college storyline, this sequel just takes like three books of the series and smashes them all together. And I was just wondering what if was your general impression like, oh, they <laughs> overall did a good job? Or were you just like, what is this banana town mumbo jumbo? <laughs> I, mean, I was just wondering what you thought of okay, it. Okay, on the scale, I'm gonna say I'm closer to the latter of those two. But <laughs> I also feel like... <laughs> Caveat, caveat, caveat. Like, let me start off just by saying I know that people are deeply attached to this miniseries. Like, people love this adaptation. And for many people, they saw it before they read the books. And so these mm -hmm. are just my opinions and feelings. I legit just watched this for the first time ever. I had never seen the miniseries. I saw, I finally saw the first one, which came out, what was that, 1985? Uh, a month ago or so, because mm -hmm. our friend, our mutual friend, Jackie, basically was like, you need to watch these, like, finally, just, you need to do it. So she sent me both of them, like, digital copies, so I didn't have an excuse. She's, she's like, you will watch these. <laughs> um, so I finally watched, I finally watched the first one for the first time, and then, you know, was just able to watch this other one now. But again, so I have this long, long history with the books, and had never seen any of the miniseries. So I think for me coming in, <laughs> Like, as a woman in her late 30s, it's just, it's going to hit differently than if I had seen this for the first time mm -hmm. in the 80s or, you know, as a child in the 90s. I don't think anything that I'm saying today, I don't think I'm right. I don't think that anyone who disagrees is wrong. There's also things that I think were absolutely, were, were probably the right choice for an adaptation. You know, even if I'm kind of like, mm, wasn't for me, but I get why they did that. But, you know, okay. So I just have to say that because... No, that's fair. I, I'm going to have, like, some all caps, like, feelings and opinions... <laughs> And I'm afraid people are going to listen to this and think that I'm just shredding this adaptation, which I'm not. It's just, <laughs> they're just things that I notice. <laughs> As I was organizing my notes, I especially noticed that I was like, oh, I really like this, but then they took it too far. And that was my note for for multiple different things. And then I noticed a theme, like they hit a mark and then they just kept hitting it and kept hitting it. Like we have to have this fun day out with the kids it gets to the end of it there's like a sheep chase right you know and it's like <laughs> what is the prop department thinking when like this director is coming up to them being like we need a bunch of sheep they're probably just like why why like <laughs> there there were just you know there were just there there were some choices and again i can kind of concede that some of those might have made sense for you know, like a TV audience. And, you know, obviously this originally aired as a miniseries. So I'm not sure how many parts, like four parts, maybe. It's like a different kind of arc, you know, like, I'm no TV show runner. So like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not gonna like criticize that. But I also have to say too, I actually disagree with you that the characters could not have played college age. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if that's maybe what Kellen, Kevin Sullivan was arguing. But t I mean, I'm pretty sure Megan Falls was only what, 20 when this, because it only came out a couple of years after the first Anna Green Gables. And in the books, when they go off to college, they're about 18, 20, 18, 21, you know, Gilbert's a little bit older than her. So I don't know, I would have totally bought it if, I mean, there's a scene with Gilbert wearing overalls in this, like looking <laughs> just like a farm boy. So I think we could have bought him as a college student. <laughs> I guess I just assumed that they thought, oh, the actors are a lot older. Let's put them in this. Because like just thinking about, OK, let me let me take three different books and write a screenplay from that. Like I'm already overwhelmed just thinking about that. So I thought maybe that's yeah, I don't know why they did that. That to me is the bigger choice is just why take three books and put them into one. And, and honestly, 
I don't even really think that you can say that they took three books and smashed them into one. They basically took, I don't know, just like a skim of Anne of Avonlea. They cut so much of Anne of Avonlea. That's true. You don't, yeah. I mean, even starting off, I was like, where's poor Mr. Harrison? We don't get Ginger the parrot. Like, he's just gone. All that, the whole scene with the cow, that happens with Mrs. Lind instead. You know, which again is fine. I understand that characters have to be cut, but like, he's gone. That one I can sacrifice, but they cut Echo Lodge, they cut Paul Irving, they cut, you know, Miss Lavender. I love Miss Lavender. And of course, one of my favorite hot literary dads, <laughs> they cut Paul Irving's dad. Oh, yeah. So he's gone. <laughs> I guess you could argue that he kind of, there's a character that I'm sure we'll discuss later on who kind of becomes like an amalgamation of like multiple different characters yeah. in their various backgrounds. And I could see a little bit of Paul Irving's dad in, in him. But yeah, so like Echo Lodge gets completely cut. All of the stuff with the Avonlea Improvement Society and just like kind of like all just kind of like the fun kind of teen shenanigans, like almost all, all that stuff just gets cut. Like just the kind yeah. of like palling around, especially with Diana and Anne and Gilbert and Fred. It basically just starts off with, you know, Diana and Fred are engaged and Anne is horrified. <laughs> just so funny to me. Like she obviously internally in the book, she's kind of sad about it. She's like, oh, we're growing up. But she's kind of nasty to Diana in this adaptation. She's just like embarrasses her in front of Fred and it's a little bit cruel, which is not at all in keeping with their friendship. So I did find that emotionally upsetting. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't mind that change, but it, it is a strange one. I just think they were trying to show that, you know, Diana is settling down and Anne's not ready for that. She doesn't want to lose this really important friendship, but yeah, it is, it is a strange change. I thought the beginning did generally a good job of showing the character of Anne and Gilbert, um, especially through Anne being kind of sneaky and saving Minnie Mae and then making her bully, like paint the building or whatever. That and then there's good. a scene right after that <laughs> with Gilbert um, just riding his bike into the creek and he's just a good sport about it and I thought oh that would be like a Gilbert thing like he's just gonna laugh it off and you know which <laughs> those were a few scenes where I was like they got it right which I was also very confused by that at first this is something that led me to do a bit of a google because I was like bicycles <laughs> like can you imagine like Avonlea would collectively faint you know everyone is riding a bicycle <laughs> the ladies are riding bicycles what is happening so I looked it up and actually <laughs> on like the kind of like official site uh for the show there is this quote that says Montgomery's novels are set in the early 1870s. Sullivan chose to set the first Anne film, Anna Green Gables, in 1900, and Anna of Avonlea, also known as Anna Green Gables, colon, the sequel, in 1904, because he liked the look of that time period better. It made for a more aesthetically pleasing film. Oh, that's good fact checking there. I didn't know that. Yeah, so it was like a deliberate choice to set it, you know, like 20, 30 years later than it is in the books. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. If that maybe possibly explains like some of the fashion choices and, and some of that. You had mentioned the scene with the cow in the beginning. Um, I actually have that listed here as like one of the things that really didn't work for me because Rachel Lind calls Anne a redheaded snippet. There's a huge fight with Marilla. And I just thought that did not do a good job of demonstrating why Marilla and Rachel have this intense friendship and why they would choose to live together and then right after that the husband dies in this very dramatic way and it's it's a lot of tonal shifts at once and a lot of intense emotion from all these different characters and I thought it was it it, it veered too much into like is this a soap opera like yeah that was a little melodramatic for me I I also did not enjoy that portrayal because by this point in the series Mrs. Lind and Anne actually have like a very warm relationship with it, with each other. You know, like Mrs. Lind is another kind of yeah. maternal figure. Um, and that was something I really missed from the first adaptation. Like specifically in the books, Mrs. Lind is the one who makes Anne her beautiful dress. Well, I mean, beautiful in the books. <laughs> Questionable if it's beautiful in the adaptation. But she's the one who makes her her first puff sleeve dress. You know, like she basically offers to help Matthew out with that. And, and so they just have like a very warm relationship and her and... Um, her and Marilla, like you said, have this really wonderful friendship and you don't really get that in the adaptation. And then in this one at the beginning where her and Anne just like going at it, I was like, what is going on? Yeah. It's like, whoa, <laughs> like everybody calm down. And I just, yeah, I just, part of what I love about the book so much is the focus on um, the female friendships and they, they, you know, they have a really warm relationship in, you know, their way, like Marilla being Marilla, <laughs> but... I don't know. Yeah, the way it's portrayed here. And, and again, I think that's why I found the 
the situation with Anne and Diana. I mean, she makes Diana cry <laughs> over her engagement. I'm just like, what's going on? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's such like a point of their friendship is that they never have those kind of tiffs. They're never any kind of that jealousy and stuff. You know, they kind of liked a little bit of the Mean Girls element. They kept that... They did that in the first book as well, where, I mean, obviously we all know Josie Pye is the worst. No one likes her. But in the in the <laughs> books, like, it's mostly one-sided. You know, Anne doesn't really engage with her other than, like, sh- taking her dare, you know, to, like, walk the ridge pole. And, but, you know, for the most part, it's like, you know, Anne just kind of, like, stays out of it. It's just not her thing. She's she's kind of like, you know, she's no drama llama. She's not into that. And in this one, like, her and, like, <laughs> there, like there's some catty scenes in this. I was like, wow, okay. I guess, I guess we haven't grown out of that yet. (laughs) But again, I can see how like, if I was watching this as like a 10 year old back in the day, I would just be like, oh, this is juicy. I'm into this. Yeah, that's a good point. I think a lot of that also comes with the, the very strange and creepy town that, that she's in, like Kingsport in the film is almost like this weird, like ancestral place where everybody's related. And I imagine them in like, murdering all the non pringles <laughs> and like the the main bully jen pringle she her eyes are terrifying like she she scares me <laughs> yeah she does look like she would come for you uh yeah it's interesting yeah. because that actually i felt like they they portrayed that really well because that's also the sense you get from the book is that i mean she's basically yeah. like living in this like weird panopticon you know she's gone off to be well, in the in the book, she got she's gone off to be the principal of the school. So that was also like an interesting change they've made because, again, in the book, she's completed her BA and now she's gone off. While while Gilbert's in medical school, she's going to be the principal at um, at Summerside, and that's also part of why her and Catherine have like this antagonistic relationship is because Catherine wanted that role of being principal, and so you know it's a whole thing again the drama. <laughs> but in this one, it's just like oh, we just don't like this new English teacher, I guess, which again is that is in keeping with the book that kind of sense of we close ranks around, you know, anybody who isn't a Pringle, which I mean, I just defy anybody to read that book or make it through this adaptation without just wanting to eat a can of Pringles. It's really difficult. (laughs) Did you did you think that was a good choice to have and just be the teacher? Um, to create more adversity and conflict between Catherine or or was that just like a missed um, thing for you? I, again, it doesn't work as well for me because I just, I, yeah. I feel like I have to apologize. I'm just, I'm so tied to the books and I know them so well. I mean, the third book I basically have memorized. And so it's kind of like, you know, every single change, like I just felt it. But yeah, like something that, that was like a small thing. So I, I can kind of see that. But again, I, I feel like the motivation is lacking a little bit more for Catherine yeah. and like why she's so nasty because in the book, part of why she's so nasty is that she's still really poor. Like she's still like all of her salary is going to paying back her family. She has these really not just like kind of prim clothes, but just, just like everything that she wears is definitely like overworn and, you know, mend, you know, like she's just, it's one of those things where Anne is kind of like, where is she spending all of her money? You know, she lives in this horrible boarding house it's like a really bad situation for her. And that's part of why Mm -hmm. she's so bitter. And on top of that, she wanted that role of principal, but didn't get it. And so there's that whole, you know, that, that whole issue. And this one, like she's in the power role, like she's the principal. (laughs) So it's, it was kind of an interesting choice, but again, I don't think it would have been, well, I'm not sure like in audience would have thought anything of it. It would have been less plausible for her like without a BA to just go off and be the principal of this ladies academy. I mean, part of why she gets that role in the books is because she has her BA from Redmond. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. we ha- apparently this is really just a mashup. Th- this this is not an adaptation of all three of these books. I feel very strongly about this. This is like there's a little bit of Anne of Avonlea, just a tiny little bit. And then it's mostly an adaptation of a kind of like slightly tilted adaptation because they did there, there were some choices of Anna the Windy Poplars plus like an epilogue it's like let's give <laughs> like let's give little Elizabeth's father an epilogue so it's basically like Captain Harris is essentially Mr. Grayson okay you know what just ignore everything that I just said this is gonna be so confusing to anybody who's listening so <laughs> like well, no I no I I it's it's confusing kind of watching it and I had to I had to go back and read so many parts of the book because I was getting confused like just going back to Catherine that scene of her 
the the conflict they have over writing her name with a C and a K. Yeah. That's actually in the book. Yep. And I'd forgotten that that was in there. But then like the movie, I had forgotten that the movie has so many scenes of them being in a fight or Catherine saying something really horrible to her all the time. Yep it's already so long and you're choosing so many things to be left out. Why are you doing this one story beat over and over and over? And it just makes the transformation at Green Gables also so sudden and kind of unbelievable. And in the book, I looked it up. Catherine becomes like a secretary to her globetrotter, which is so cool. And like, why not put that in there if you want her to have all these dreams of like traveling? But then it's just like, oh, all, all she needed to do was like hold a baby and suddenly her hairstyle <laughs> like changes. And like, well, <laughs> like that's she, her magic transformation. She does get the job as like the globetrotting secretary after her and Anne have become friends. So, you know, there's there's that element. But yeah, like I feel like in... Part of what happens in the the books is, you know, Anna's like really kind of been working on her for a while and then invites her to come to Green Gables and, you know, they have like their breakthrough moment and stuff. I mean, that is kind of like a hallmark for Ella Montgomery, I feel like, though, is just, you know, I will push through this character is like all their hurt and pain and past trauma just by, you know, like giving them. Oh, yeah, like- yeah, yeah. It's the it's. <laughs> The Sailor Moon moment. It's that female power fantasy yeah. of like, oh, my love can change anything. I will give you like a hug and a cookie and you will realize that you have self-worth and it will be fine. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, that, 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 yeah, like you said, that kind of sudden shift when they're at Green Gables, that, that actually felt like pretty close to the book to me, but I don't know. I'm just, I, I know we've kind of like moved on, but I'm just still not over all the stuff that got cut, <laughs> but but let me say, like, I understand that when you, I understand that when you're making an adaptation, like, not everything makes a cut, like, obviously. But they cut so much stuff, but then they still, like, added stuff. So I'm kind of like, yeah. you did have time. You just chose to use it in ways that to this viewer were very, very bizarre. Again, I think probably because anybody who knows me knows that all I really want is a proper Anne on the Island adaptation. Like, I think that book on its own could just make a beautiful standalone period drama romance like you wouldn't even need the other kind of past knowledge like it's not even necessary like just that book is like a perfect arc Mm. like going off to college and having all the shenanigans there and you know that kind of coming of age and it's just it's so good there's so many great side characters and it's all just gone and also i mean i don't really mind i get why they had to cut davy and dora (laughs) from the adaptation like we don't need to add like two more small children no, I don't want Davy. No, thank you. <laughs> to this miniseries. So I was fine with that. But, you know, like, <laughs> but, you know, like, no Paul Irving, like I said. And then just all the literary houses that got cut. So we don't get Echo Lodge or Miss Lavender. We don't get Patty's Place, which is an Anne of the Island. We don't even get the house of Wendy Poplar's, you know, which is where Anne actually boards. Like in the book, she doesn't live at the school. She lives with Aunt Chatty and Aunt Kate. So <laughs> it's just... I'm just, you know, part of what I'm looking for in adaptations is like, I want the visuals from these places that I've been reading about. And it didn't give me that. And I was very sad. And I'm assuming a lot of that's also budget related because, you know, obviously. Although, again, no, because we also get like a fancy house in Boston. Because Anne goes to Boston, guys. I don't know if you knew about that. Yeah, we don't need like 10 scenes of Catherine being like, how dare you wear earrings or, you know, whatever she says. Like, and I also wrote that down that I really did miss kind of the magic of Patty's place. And there's just this roommate situation there that's, it's just so much fun. It's, and It's just so much fun. And like that whole like experience of being at college and, and doing that whole thing, like the co-ed lifestyle, you know, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I just really, really miss that. It is my absolute favorite book. And just to see it, essentially not I mean none of it made it into this adaptation the only thing that is from Anne of the Island is the first proposal with her and Gilbert that's it I mean it's not doesn't take place in the the same location or anything but that's really the only kind of like pivotal plot thing I feel like that comes out from that book and then otherwise we're just right on to Wendy Poplar's and like I said plus the addition of this like weird epilogue because (laughs) So in the book, she is living at Wendy Poplar's and there's this little girl who is her next door neighbor, little Elizabeth, and she's just this kind of, you know, Anne seems to always acquire these like fae children around her, like these little pixie sprites (laughs) who are not really human. (laughs) And so little Elizabeth is a prime example of that. She's basically like a girl version of Paul Irving. And 
they strike up a friendship. And so at one point, like basically Anne has written to her father, been like, do you know, you know, your daughter loves you, et cetera, et cetera. You know, <laughs> basically like summons dad home. <laughs> and so we basically encounter him at the very, very end of the book, Pierce Grayson. Again, another hot dad from the series, like Anna Green Gable series, full of great hot dads. <laughs> and and he, he being one of them. But in this, they basically turned him into the character of Captain Harris, who is, by the way, guys, Anne's love interest in the series. Gilbert, I didn't clock it, but I think Gilbert is on screen for like, what, 10 minutes? He's basically not in this movie. He's hardly in the miniseries at all. This Captain Harris guy, he's the whole yeah. thing. That's the whole thing is about yeah. him and her relationship with him and like going to Boston with him and his family. And <laughs> I was just like, what is going on? And I should have known from the very beginning, because I think... Isn't he like the hot, mysterious older man who at the very beginning is like helping her when she loses all her papers at the shore? Like that's, yeah. 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 So they have that encounter there and then they have another encounter where they run into each other on the road and they have like a fight. And I was like, oh, this is turning into some serious enemies to lovers business. Like what is going on? <laughs> and I, I still couldn't tell like if it was going to be, like if he was going to be more of just like a, like a Mr. Harrison type of character. Just like, you know, because one of the things about Anna, she has lots of friendships with, you know, you know, men, women, everyone, right? So I was like, this doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be like a, ro a romantic thing, but also like he was way too kind of like dreamy, broody, you know, and that <laughs> and that kind of like 1980s period drama kind of way. So I was like, mm. until he's not, until he's like suddenly smiling all the time <laughs> when they have that handshake in the office. I did wonder though, as I was rewatching it, I was like, is Diane going to categorize this man as a hot dad? Like, <laughs> of course. <laughs> I mean, so many hot dads in this. We have, I mean, my still my favorite from the first adaptation was Papa Barry, you know, Diana's dad, like oh, really, yeah. really bringing that energy. <laughs> and then this one, we get uh, Gilbert Bly's dad. We finally get to see him. And I was like, look, it's, it's Papa Bly, hot dad number two. <laughs> and then of course, you know, we get Captain Harris, who's basically supposed to be all the hot, hot dads, like wrapped up into one. But, but speaking of Gilbert Bly's dad, that moment <laughs> with him and Marilla, where like, <laughs> that, that moment where you know he's the whole thing with the cow has happened and whatever and they're basically having this awkward encounter and they're kind of having their like oh remember when like look back situation it was pretty great it was just like oh look at you look at you two and then you know Anne comes storming in because her and Gilbert have had a fight because he's been you know criticizing her or whatever and he's like apple doesn't fall far from the tree I was like whoa burn <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was pretty cute <laughs> <laughs> oh that did make me laugh um yeah mr i, I thought he was called mr harris he, is it mr grace no so in the um in the adaptation he's captain harris um you know so mrs harris captain harris yeah, mrs yes. harris is like the kind of crotchety old lady who is basically like a mashup of Mrs. Campbell, who was little Elizabeth's like scary grandma, and also like yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like you know, one of the many, you know, there's many like Pringles. yeah, one of the many Pringles. So she, she's kind of like a mashup of all of those characters, and also a mashup of um, I don't know if you remember this from Anna Wendy Poplar. So it's a character Pauline Gibson and Mrs. Gibson, and Pauline Gibson just has to like wait on her mother hand and foot, and her mother is yeah. like an invalid, and, and Anne actually does help her like go to a wedding and. So that all is straight from the book. And I totally understood the choice to smash up those characters, um, especially the Mrs. Gibson storyline, because it's really just one of those kind of, you know, side little anecdotes that I feel like Elle Montgomery is so famous for. Just like, oh, let's just spend like a whole chapter telling you a story about these people that you haven't seen previously in the book and you'll never see again, but actually kind of integrating it into the storyline. And that, I have to say, was my favorite adaptation change like change from the books because one of the things I've always been sad about in the books is like basically Pauline just comes back from the wedding and is want want I'll just get back to the grind and in this one she gets her happy ending she gets to finally marry Isaac Kent and I was just like yes Pauline escapes yeah and I I thought also they did a good job of combining characters combining some of the storylines um, but also with that with the with the older woman that's like this matriarch but is always like oppressive and has this emotional stuntedness and is like guilt tripping and like manipulating everyone around her like it's a it's an every montgomery story and i just i just want to know like 
what she lived through living with her grandma and if it all comes from that because like it's always there oh i would imagine like every so book. yeah and if you ever read her biography the the house of dreams biography it is pretty informative <laughs> you're kind of you're like wow i will never see any of these books in the same light ever again and i think what is also wild is that basically in her later life she kind of turned into one of those characters and that in some ways for me is the saddest thing like she really was like really oh, yeah. clingy with her own son and you know like th there was some of that kind of same same sort of situation so yeah. it kind of all went yeah. full circle for her because i i don't know you, you just have the sense that this I mean, this is me, like, this is total author pop psychology, but you do kind of get the sense of this woman who, even <laughs> though she was enormously successful and, like, was very popular, and even, you know, in her own lifetime, I don't know, it's like she was never really fully actualized, like, she never really got what she was searching for in some ways, is, yeah. this is, this is totally me, like, looking into my, like, crystal ball, um, this is my gut feeling about things, but, yeah, so totally recommend that biography, though, it's very well done. Oh, yeah, that's a good recommendation. Thank you. Um, I had another question. Emmeline does say that her last name is Harris. But did you put that together that this other character was going to end up being her dad? Or was that like a surprise twist? Um, I don't remember us knowing that his name, like, I feel like we don't even know his name until after Anne realizes that he's her dad. Like, oh, we? maybe you're like, right. Yeah, because I feel like he's... I thought he introduces himself when he gets her, tries to get her cart going with the car or something. Oh, maybe. I probably wasn't paying attention that well at that point. But yeah, so Captain Harris, he is... Yeah, I wonder why they changed the name, because they <laughs> would have been a little less confusing, at least for discussion purposes, because he... He basically is that role of Mr. Grayson from the book, which again is a character that only comes in at the very, very end. And he's just like so grateful to Anne for, you know, thank you for telling me about, you know, I didn't realize that she'd grown up so much and it's like a whole thing. And I think in the book, he's been living in Paris, but they change it to Boston in the adaptation, which again, that gives me Paul Irving dad vibes. So they're just like a lot... <laughs> It really just makes you realize there's like a lot of children in this series that have been sent to live with other relatives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is definitely a thing. Yeah, the the fight that um, I feel like Anne and Mr. Hare or Captain Harris have like so many fights too. They, they fight over the oil tycoon's daughter right before he proposes to her. And then... I mean, she's really, she's really acting like she's in love with him. Like I, it, yeah. I will say that if I did not know anything about the books if I had never read them ever. Just like, didn't even know that was a thing. And I was just watching this. Well, certainly if yeah. I had watched this as a young child, I would have still been team Gilbert all the time. Cause you know, he's, th this guy would have seemed so old in comparison. But watching this now as a grown adult, if I didn't know anything about the books, I would be like, why didn't you marry this guy? Because he's just, he's so much of the movie. You, that's who you are with the whole time. And the way that they played it, I, I found them actually a more believable couple in some ways, which is complete sacrilege, not only to anybody who's listening to this, I'm sure who's screaming right now, but also to me as somebody who everyone knows is like the president of the Gilbert Blythe fan club. But it's just, he's barely in this. He's hardly in it. Diane is canceling herself. I just, I mean, it was really, that was truly my number one criticism of this was there wasn't enough Gilbert. <laughs> there just wasn't. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Harris, he, like, suddenly starts shouting at her from his car using her Christian name. He starts calling her. And I, I have that very same note here. I'm like, it, what are you doing? Like, why are we spending so much time with this guy? And then it kind of leads nowhere. And I I watched part of the director's commentary, and I watched the scene where they have that proposal in the snow. And Kevin Sullivan was saying, like, oh, she needed this moment to realize what she really wanted. And I'm like, okay, but did we need to spend like three hours to get there? Like, I, it's just such a strange choice to me and such a strange way to focus the story. I mean, there are definitely parts of the book, especially in book two, where Gilbert is kind of barely there. But it's like, why would you hone in on that aspect? Well, <laughs> like, no, we need less Gilbert. I think, yeah, in particular, it's like, it's not like there aren't those scenes with Gilbert. They just cut those scenes with Gilbert. So that, they cut them. I'm yeah. Just like, did, was Jonathan Crombie like, I have one day of filming. You get all my scenes done. I got things to do. Yeah. Like that was kind of almost <laughs> the impression because he's there at the very beginning and he's there at the very end. And otherwise he's not present at all. And I, again, I feel like if you haven't read the books, you're kind of like, I don't, I, I guess like their childhood friends, like whatever. I'm wondering if what Kevin Sullivan meant by that as well is that he's kind of 
he's clearly stepping in for that kind of Roy Gardner role, which is the guy that she does kind of start to see after she turns down Gilbert and, you know, then he proposes and then she says no. She still doesn't realize that she wants to be with Gilbert, but she's just like, oh, I, I can't be with you. But the whole thing with their relationship is that, you know, he's escorting her to college functions. Um, you know, it's, it's that kind of a relationship. And she does meet his family because they come to town to visit, but she doesn't, like, go on a trip with them to Boston or anything like that, you know? So so I think he was Captain Harris is kind of, again, sort of playing that Pierce Grayson role um, in terms of having a daughter and, you know, having like a tragic backstory with his, his wife and all of that, but also kind of an am am amalgamation with Roy Gardner, at least in terms of being hot and rich, um, not necessarily in terms of his personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting because, again, in the books, you get the sense that even though Anne is with Roy Gardner, you get enough kind of glimpses into her mind to understand that she's kind of like, this is what it's supposed to be like. I guess I must be in love with him. You know, he's just so dreamy. But you never get the sense that she's like really pining for him. And even there are some instances where they will go to a college function and she'll see Gilbert with somebody else. Like she'll see Gilbert with Christine. And she's just like eaten up with jealousy, even if she doesn't really understand why she's so jealous. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this, she's like totally making eyes at Captain Harris. Like I, I'm like, I completely find this believable that she's like oh you know of course i'll save a waltz for you <laughs> just like what's happening <laughs> i i want to talk about roy i i feel bad for him and lets him court her for like two years and then turns him down i just two years I, I'm sorry two years like, <laughs> what are you doing like it's really bad yeah I mean, and that, again, is one of the things that you're missing from the Patty's Place gang is Phil Gordon always there to tell you what's up. You know, like she tells her what's up after she turns down Gilbert the first time. She's all, you're an idiot. <laughs> you don't even know what love <laughs> is, which they did give that speech to Marilla. I, I kind of did love that, actually, having Marilla and her have that conversation. I mean, it's really interesting that they made the choice where in this, you know, Anne knows basically before he even tells her. I mean, he, she might have had her suspicions because she's always like, oh, he's getting kind of you know, Mooney again, <laughs> but for the most part, you know, she's just like, oh, we're just really good chums. But in this Marilla's all, oh, by the way, Gilbert's in love with you. <laughs> she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, in, in, in the books, Phil is the one who gives her that lecture, you know, at Patty's place where she's like, you don't even know what love is. And then after she turns down Roy, she's like, wow, that was really bad. <laughs> so, everybody needs a Phil Gordon in their life, basically. Yeah. She's a fun character that yeah, again, was completely cut. I think they kind of mentioned it a little bit, but one of my favorite little side stories, and I know you love this one too, is Jane Andrews marrying the Winnipeg yeah, the millionaire. Yeah, the Winnipeg millionaire. <laughs> and they're like, oh, he's so ancient. I'm like, but the guy they cast doesn't, I mean, like he's bald, but he doesn't look like he's really some aged. I mean, I think in the books, he's supposed to be like in his mid forties or whatever, but <laughs> I didn't I didn't instantly look at those two actors and think, oh, there's a 25 year age difference, you know, <laughs> so right. I thought that was that was really funny. But again, I don't think this this adaptation doesn't necessarily seem to care about that as much as it's like we say it and it's true. Like they're always talking about Fred's appearance, which they also do that in the books. I mean, Ella Montgomery, love her, you know, obviously her books are monumentally influential, but she is definitely has some tendencies. I think of her time towards some fat shaming and just like being really obsessed with everyone's appearance. Like everyone has to be pretty. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's like the number one mm -hmm. thing that anybody can be is to be pretty. And it's so, you know, they, they kind of make some jokes about it in the book about, um, and, and Diana even says like, Oh, we're going to just be like the, um, the tubbiest couple <laughs> because in the book, you know, they're both kind of described as, quote unquote stouter, which I'm not even sure what that really means by the standards of that time. But in this adaptation, like they're both, I, I was like, he's the same size as Gilbert. What is everyone talking about? I don't understand. Yeah. It doesn't make any yeah, sense. Yeah, I agree. And also they make him such, Frank is such a grump. Again, part of what is so fun about him in the books is Diana's like, yeah, he isn't that dreamy ideal. He isn't that kind of tall, dark and handsome guy I thought I was going to marry. He's Fred. He's jolly. He's fun loving. He's a good guy. You know, like he's a cinnamon roll. I'm going to marry like the cinnamon roll. And in this, he's just grumpy. He's always kind of glowering and he's like, come on, Diana, we got to go. And it's like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was not here for, I was not here for the, the maligning of poor Fred's character. Justice, justice for Fred. <laughs> I, 
think the the biggest crime that this movie commits is the scene where Gilbert is at Diana's wedding. He proposes to Anne to ditch his date to drive her home, which he Gilbert would never do that. After she rejects him, he hopes Amon would break Anne's heart. He asks her over and over after that because he thinks she'll come around, she'll come to her senses. Like, I, I, who can read this book and think, oh, I'm going to make Gilbert an incel? Like, that, he's not going to take no for an answer. Like, <sighs> every time I watch that scene, I'm just like, oh, I get so mad. Are we going to do this, Tavi? Because I, I have feelings about this. <laughs> I was just livid i was livid <laughs> like rage first of all yeah. i get what they did it because i understand people like that kind of like banter and stuff it's not it's not necessarily to my taste i mean i i don't mind it and i have certainly enjoyed other characters with that kind of personality and other books but for me that's not gilbert and in this like at the beginning he's kind of cocky he's like a little bit annoying i don't know like he's just yeah. like a little bit of a pest and i was not here for that energy that's me personally totally understand other people you know feeling like it really worked for them and then from there, like, they're almost like kind of antagonistic with each other and kind of sending with one another. And then, yeah, they, to go into this, like first they have their first proposal, which <laughs> I do have to say, I made this note. It's basically the Lori Joe proposal from Little Women. Like that's what that first proposal in this adaptation is. She's all, I can't keep your oh. house. We'd fight all the time. I'd be unhappy. Every and he's all, like, everyone expects it, which is like definitely like a Lori line. It's just, it's so Joe and Lori to me. The whole energy where she's she's like, I'm, I'm made for more than to be a wife. And you know, you, you think you love me, but really we'd make each other so unhappy and we'd fight all the time. Um, anyway. Well, and then uh, so I'm just going to interject really quickly, but I actually had a note about the conversation that Anne and Gilbert have about her writing, she actually has that with Mr. Harrison in the book. Like, oh, your writing yep. is too flowery. Yep. And it felt very much like, a, again, little. I have a note in here about Little Women, about it being the Mr. Bear, or whatever his name is, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and Joe. I feel like the production team, there was definitely like a hardcore Little Women fan somewhere. I don't know if it was Kevin Sullivan. I don't know if it was somebody else, but the proposal and yeah, him kind of like giving her tips on her writing as opposed to that coming from Mr. Harrison, all of that just, it felt so, so little women, like really they gave her a lot of Joe energy. I feel like in this adaptation. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, when, so they have their first proposal, they have their first like little women proposal. And then when they're at the wedding, this is when it really, for me, I'm just like, no, I cannot with this. Although, side note, really shout out to the wedding decor, which even though it's a period piece, still felt like distinctly 1980s to me, which I really did kind of appreciate. Um, I was into it. So. <laughs> I was like, oh, yes, this really has that that kind of 1980s, like so many, so many bows, like the wicker furniture, everything about it. It was, I was really like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, give me my Laura Ashley dress. It's giving me a whole vibe. But... <laughs> Gilbert is just so bitter here. He's so bitter. He That whole line about like, oh, well, you'll probably just fall in love with some guy who will read you Tennyson by firelight. I'm like, oh, LOL, LOL. That's totally something Gilbert would do. Like that is like a hallmark of your guys' relationship. Even after you're married, you're always like quoting literature off the top of your head because apparently people in this era just had books memorized. So, <laughs> and yeah, he's just so bitter. And then when he walks away, he's all, I hope he breaks your heart. I, I, what? I, I almost just like, I was just like picked up my laptop and threw it at the wall. <laughs> yeah, it's like your your eyes are popping out of your head. You're like, what did I just watch? I yeah, it was wholly unacceptable to me. I I'm like, okay, you know, you take away my Patty's place, you take away like all the Redmond College fun, all of that, and this is what you give me instead. It's just bitter Gilbert who is just. I hope he breaks your heart. I mean, that's part of the point in the book. It's just he's like. He's like, I, he's like, it's my mistake. You know, I, I thought that you cared about me. He's like, I clearly like tricked myself into thinking that. Spoiler alert. No, you actually didn't, Gilbert. But, you know, he's, you know, he <laughs> says the right thing. And then he's just like, I mean, the most bitter he gets is that when she's like, I hope we can be friends. And he's like, you, you know, you're telling me I can have your friendship. He's like, I want your love. And, and that's like as bitter as he gets. It's just really, which I wouldn't even classify that as being better he's just being really honest with her like kind of explaining to her like this yeah is... it's like setting boundaries yeah. and telling her what yeah. he can and can't do he's basically do. saying like no like i get that that works for you but it doesn't work for me and then they go on to have like a perfectly cordial relationship he still comes to patty's place sometimes just to like you know for their you know the evenings that they entertain and stuff and you know they encounter each other at, at collegiate functions it's not like this thing where um he's like you broke my heart and i hope this man who reads you tennyson just you know crushes you <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so God, so yeah. weird to me yeah again it's one of those choices that's like and now you took it over the top yeah yeah it's just, <laughs> it keeps happening like a little bit soapy to me so um, yes i i don't know i just i wasn't here for that and then of course we get that and and it's like, okay, Gilbert's gone now. Let us now devote all of our screen time to Hot Dad. <laughs> and, and I'm like, hot I was dad. waiting. I was almost like waiting. I was like, is she going to actually marry him? Like, is this like a totally off the rails adaptation? Do we never see Gilbert again? I was really starting to wonder if that was going to be the case because, but I feel like if that was true, somebody would have told me. But <laughs> <laughs> Warned you. Yeah, I, I feel like I would have been warned. I just, yeah, we, we spend <laughs> easily twice as much, three times as much screen time with him as we do with Gilbert. He's just very much the focus. And I guess I can kind of understand if Kevin Sullivan said, oh, you know, she needed this. It was kind of like part of her, like figuring out who she really was. Whereas in, you know, in the books, it's partially just her growing up. Like Gilbert proposes and then they're still in college for two more years. So she's going through that Mm -hmm. whole process of just, you know, growing into adulthood. And then, of course, the situation with Roy Gardner. But yeah, in this one, she's like having a romance, basically, with (laughs) this guy. (laughs) And it kind of sneaks up on you, too. Because really, until it was really happening, I was still like, is he into her? Is she into him? What's going on here? Is this really just like, oh, he's just like a kind dad who's kind of like kind of be just like another kind of mentor figure for her? Or is this going somewhere? <laughs> I'm Wait a minute. I'm feeling highly suspicious right now. <laughs> like, those are all things that yeah. are going through my head. Yeah. As, as they should. Because it was done very strangely. I just want to come back to Little Women one more time because our mutual, another mutual friend, Romy, she had brought up recently that people like Anne and also people like Joe, like they have this, these dreams of like, oh, I don't want to get a husband. I want to be a, a writer. And she mentioned that having these realistic endings for them where they do end up having just a million children, it's what would have happened, but is it empowering to young readers? Right at the time and does that set a good example for you know ambitions that girls get to have and I kind of I started to question like the choices both of these authors made and in terms of Alka we know she didn't have that much freedom over you know what she could even do with her characters so I don't know I'm conflicted I mean that's kind of interesting I think I mean in the case of Joe I think I can definitely see making that argument because she is so kind of heartily opposed, which again was why that first proposal really just, you know, screamed Joe and Lori to me. But Anne as a character has always just been the person who dotes on babies, who can't wait, you know what I mean? Like you've never for once gotten the impression that she isn't just like ready to like have a family and do that whole thing, you know? And again, of of course you have to recognize that obviously within this time period, there would have been a lot of social pressure and that would have been like part of her upbringing to to feel that way anyway, but at least in, in kind of what we're presented as her character, I never get the impression that she is yearning to do, you know, like so many other things. Um, and she does write and, you know, publish some little sketches. Well, I mean, in this, she gets her full book. So there is that moment, which also right. I was like, oh, wow, this is like the most recent Little Women adaptation where at the end, Joe gets her book. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I do think it's kind of sad that there is one little scene, I think it's in House of Dreams, where... He encourages her to write the story of this, you know, old seaman. And she's like, oh, I don't, I'm not that great of a writer. I don't do that anymore. And that kind of gets dropped. And I just in that moment, I wanted to be like, oh, it's sad that she's kind of let that go so much. I've always, I've always been kind of split on that too. Because on the one hand, I also have been like, what are you talking about, Anne? Like, you're great. I don't necessarily get the impression that she's like, oh, I can't do it because I'm a woman. In the book, she's right. kind of like, this is a story that needs to be basically be told by like the great Canadian writer. She's like, and that's, that's not me. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's, it's hard to know, I think, because of the gender stuff and because the person who does ultimately end up writing the book is a man, yeah. you know, if, if it's meant to be like a kind of gendered commentary or if it's really just Anne being really self-aware, I think, you know, in a way that's very, a lot of people aren't, which is like, I know what my talents are and my talents are not this. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I'm really good right. at writing little fanciful sketches for children I am not good at this sort of thing like that's not what I want to do so that that is like one of those I think kind of tricky dynamics especially again because the book is ultimately written and it's you know written by one of our other favorite hot broody guys <laughs> not a hot dad though <laughs> I do like this Just guy. Just like yeah. so many like <laughs> freakishly attractive people wandering around Prince Edward Island in this time. 
According to Ella Montgomery, the world of Prince Edward Island in the late 19th century is just like hotties galore. Every- everyone's so attractive. <laughs> um, the only other note I had was I really love when she wins the baking competition. Everyone's congratulating her and she's like smiling, but it's so forced. And I just, oh, it always makes me laugh. And I always think it's so cute. I mean, that, that is, <laughs> yeah, that is pretty funny. She's just, and it keeps coming up. Like, basically throughout, like, the Pringles, like, taunt her for it, you know? Like, she's just... Yeah. (laughs) It it, it never really goes away. So, uh, yeah. The other thing I feel like we we have to talk about the fact is that Mrs. Harris also kind of has, like, some Lady Catherine energy, you know? Like, you're just waiting. Like, as she's being rolled out of Maplehurst for the picnic day that Anne's kind of surprised her with, I'm just waiting for her to be like, the shades of Maplehurst will be polluted. (laughs) The one, the thing in this adaptation, though, the moment where I was just like, that's it. It was all, it was all worth it for this moment. (laughs) Like, it's after the whole situation with all the sheep that you mentioned earlier. And Mrs. Harris, who's been just a real delightful termagant, you know, just like kind of the worst, but also you kind of love her. And then she starts making that little Bo Peep joke. (laughs) I I cackled. I was was like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah, it's a transformation for sure. (laughs) Apparently in that scene where they like wheel her out, that actress broke her hip. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, they had to like stop everything and they weren't even sure if they were going to get her back or like what had happened. And but yeah, they they stopped and eventually she came back to to finish the part. (laughs) That is wild. That is wild to me. (laughs) She's Uh, like, I'm a professional. Yeah, yeah, I can I can do it. (laughs) Um, although her having an accident kind of, that reminds me of the fact that I love how in the books, Anne is so graceful. Like, again, that's one of her physical hallmarks is and one of the things where even though she's not, you know, she's, she's one of those, I'm not pretty, but actually I'm really pretty kind of girls. You, you yeah. know, it's one of those sorts of things <laughs> so that even though, you know, maybe she doesn't look like that raven haired beauty or, or whatever, you know, obviously she, she obviously grows into this like very graceful willowy blah, blah, blah. Like we get it. You know, Anna's very pretty. Um, <laughs> But in this, they made her, like, kind of, like, klutzy and quirky. <laughs> was that fun or did you hate it? I just thought it was an interesting choice. You know, I was like, I, I need to yeah. know more about this as a decision because it was a very deliberate choice to make her, you know, like, not like other girls. <laughs> so, like... I, I honestly, it worked for me. I, I liked it. And especially because later on, like, Anna Vangel's side is really where it starts, where it's like, people are describing her as an angel and like is Anne even like a human anymore or is she just like this mystical being (laughs) yeah they did give her like a little bit more spice I will say that like in this yeah because in the book basically she just finds these journals and she sends them off to the Pringles just like oh I thought you might like these she hadn't read through the whole thing she just or I think she had read through the whole thing but hadn't even like occurred to her she's just like oh you know there's so many nice things in here about your father I thought you'd really appreciate it and of course they assume that she's blackmailing them and she's like oh my god I would never ever 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 do that and then they're just like oh we misjudged you and it's like one of those whole like oh the the path of the righteous you know (laughs) will be its own reward kind of situations and in this she's kind of like well i think i could be convinced to stay quiet if you let me tutor emily (laughs) (laughs) it's like okay this Anne has like a little bit more bite to her the the other thing i just have to say you can cut, literally cut out anything else. Feel free. Delete everything else I've said. Tabby, fine. No problem. But I, I won't, but, this, but go this ahead. This is essential. <laughs> Gilbert and Christine get engaged. I, what? That was, I mean, even more so than him being like a real grumpy Gus. Even more so than that. The fact that then she shows up and just like, oh, I've been wanting to run into you. Yeah, Christine and I are engaged. And she's just like, oh, I'm so happy for you. I'm just like, what? What is happening? What is going on? He would never. And then if he did, he wouldn't call it off. That's just like not Gilbert. You know what I mean? I just can't imagine. Yeah, he's going to stick by it because that's just his character. I mean, his character would not be to get engaged to Christine in the first place. I don't like any of this. Uh, No, I do not approve. I do not like that choice. Like, it didn't even feel necessary to me, again, from like a storytelling perspective, because it's not like her finding out. I mean, they get their like little kind of train moment but it's not like her finding out about that is what makes her realize she loves him you know what i mean like yeah she still then goes on to have continue to have like that kind of quasi romance with captain harris so i am just i'm not i'm not really sure why that decision was made to other than again to up the drama and the way that i watched this was like on one continuous thing so i'm not sure if maybe there was like some kind of like big ad break or you know maybe that's where an episode ended or something was oh my god and Gilbert's engaged and then it's like 
you know, fade to black or whatever. Yeah, I'm just wondering, is are they too concerned with trying to, like, psych you out? Because, like, not everybody has read this Maybe? and it's the 80s and you can't just Google it and, like, oh, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna, like, have this big surprise. I, I don't know. Do they get too into, like, trying to trick you? <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, just the whole thing with Gilbert. First, he's a jerk about Anne saying no, and then he gets engaged. And he's also kind of like, yeah, I mean, her dad is like really prominent. I was like, oh, you gonna get married to Christine because her dad is like a really prominent doctor? This is... <laughs> All of this is against everything that I believe about Gilbert as a person. <laughs> And the perfect man. Um, I did like the bedside change. That that was actually kind of nice. The whole like her like going to see him while he's sick. That that was really nice. And I, I thought kind of like a lovely moment. I, and I also, I still miss them having their proper proposal moment as well at the end. She, she's just kind of like, oh, I can just kind of like walk you over here for like five minutes because I got to get ready to go to this party. <laughs> Because, like, in the book, basically, she's going to Alice Penhall's wedding and she has to get ready. She's she's sewing up her dress and he shows up. He's like, oh, you know, could we go for a ramble? And she's like, oh, I can't. I have to get this ready. And then I have to get ready to go. He's like, oh, can we go tomorrow? And she's like, of course. And she's doing that thing where she's kind of stewing. She's like, oh, I really thought that, like, I don't think he really loves me anymore because... He, he just seemed like totally okay with us just going tomorrow. He doesn't even seem upset about it. You know, she's like way overthinking all of it. And then the next day they, they do go for their walk and they actually go into the orchard. And like, you can just, I don't know why they didn't want to take advantage of this just from a filming perspective. Cause you can just get the visual of like, just them being surrounded by the trees and like basically like in this bower, like their lovebird bower, <laughs> essentially like. Come on. I feel like that's like peak filmmaking. But yeah, no, this, she's just like, oh yeah, Catherine and I are going to this bonfire. I guess you're not invited. Oh, let's just like walk over to the bridge for half a second. We'll get engaged. And then I'll just go, I'll just go back inside. Go to the bonfire, I guess. I'll see you tomorrow. It's so weird. Yeah, that, that would have been nice to change that setting. I know that for part of that whole conversation, they're not actually on that bridge. They're standing on like something else. There's a lake in the distance and then they found a tree that's like a similar shade as like the trees of fall because it had gotten to like winter time but they had these earlier shots from the fall of them on the bridge so to match that like half the scene is actually not on the bridge at all and if you look at the background you can see it like completely changes (laughs) (laughs) but yeah that's great anyways I feel like also I have to hear your thoughts. I need to know because I feel like you always have opinions about the fashion is one, what were your thoughts on Anne's quote unquote best dress? Like the one that she wears to Diana's wedding and then the one that she lends to Pauline. So I think it's the same dress. And then also what were your thoughts on her hospital, like the gown that she wears to the hospital bazaar? I I need your, I need your hot takes on that. Oh my gosh. I don't, I don't even remember them. I think this, this show generally just makes a mistake of having the actors wear clothes that are too big for them, uh, especially with Manarilla, which I already mentioned in the previous one, that, that scene with Gilbert where he's wearing like a sweater, but it's way too long and big for him. Right. And like the armpit holes are just like halfway down his body. Like way, like, like this low cleavage, like <laughs> vest he's wearing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I generally like the fashion. I like that kind of, the the style. Is that, But now I'm confused. You're saying this is supposed to be in the early 1900s? Because for some reason, I remember them being more like, I don't know, I'm thinking like Gilded Age stuff. But Uh, I mean, that's that's what I read on the website. I I think maybe that was like, this is why we have bicycles and stuff. I have no idea. But yeah, um, and also to explain the cars, you know, obviously. So yeah, I think a lot of it is just like, this is what we have in the wardrobe yeah, yeah. trunk, <laughs> like, you know, which I totally get that. I think some of it was to ex- explain set pieces. But yeah, instead of setting it in the 1870s and 1880s, it's supposed to take place in the early 1900s. Uh, yeah, I just, the, the dress that she wears to Diana's wedding and like her best dress, I'm just like, mm, this is not really working for me. This looks like a kind of satiny, hideous 1980s bridesmaid's dress. I was impressed, though, that at least all the girls had, they made, they seem to have made, like, a school uniform for them, and there were a lot of extras for that. I was, that's probably where most of their budget went. Yeah. <laughs> making a school uniform. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the, definitely, the, like, the school became the setting. Like, that was the focus of the whole adaptation was we're at the school and the characters at the school and and all of, all of that. In the book, too, at least, Jen Pringle does get her, like, redemption arc. Like, basically, she goes on to be one of um, Anne's favorite students, and it's, like, a whole thing. So <laughs> I think she visits them at Ingleside at one point in time in one of the later books. Like, you know, it's pretty interesting. They try to do that here at the end, and I'm like, I'm, I'm still terrified of you. <laughs> like, I don't trust you. <laughs> 
She's got those eyes. <laughs> Any anything else? Any other notes you had about this? I mean, I don't think so. I feel like I have really just wrung every little last thing about this adaptation. And I also feel like I have to say, like, I really did enjoy watching it. You know, it's, it's a fun thing. And for me, even if an adaptation isn't, these aren't the choices I would have made, or I'm kind of confused by it, or I'm kind of baffled, you know, like, I still appreciate just all the work that went into it. And can also appreciate it for what it is. It just maybe, you know, I'm, I'm like, oh, that was a choice. <laughs> Not necessarily what I would have done. Did you like this one better than the first one, or do you Ooh. think the first one is the best one? That is true. Because I think that is tricky. The for first me. one does a better job of like sticking to the. I think the probably books. the first one. I mean, just yeah. the the actor who plays Matthew. It's so lovely, and um, yeah. I think they really did a good job, especially for using the same actress of really transitioning her from you know kind of younger to older and making that pretty believable. I mean, the first thing, the first adaptation also does some stuff that's for me, I was kind of like, this is wild. Like Diana being all, I'm in love with Gilbert. <laughs> You're like, what? And and also Marilla freaking out. And I can't believe you accepted a ride home from Gilbert. <laughs> it's like some drama <laughs> that I felt was unnecessary, but I get it, you know, for the TV audience at home. Because the whole, that, that one ends with Diana being all, so you don't mind if like, you know, I go for Gilbert and you're kind of like, oh, what are, what are we setting up here? It doesn't, Nothing. it doesn't Nothing. come back at all. And this one, other than <laughs> she basically says, well, I had to marry Fred because you told me I couldn't have Gilbert. I'm just like, poor Fred. <laughs> Second choice again. Like, just, <laughs> I feel like this whole production team, in addition to there being somebody who was really like a big fan of Little Women, there was really apparently somebody who was not a fan of Fred as a character. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so glad you finally watched this, even though Jackie and I forced you to do it. Uh, <laughs> it was long overdue. Everyone tells me because they know that I've been increasingly baffled by the adaptations. They're like, oh, do not watch the third one. Do not watch the third one. But I think like, I kind of have I haven't seen it yet either. I'm scared. I think I have to. I know enough about it. I mean, I know that basically it's Rilla of Ingleside, but they give it to Anne and Gilbert. Like Gilbert's the one who goes off to World War One, and it's a whole thing. So it's 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 not even like different. It's completely different from their storyline in the books. But I feel like that one actually might be so wild that I might be kind of into it as like I don't know, just as like a fun thing. <laughs> so I might have to check that one out. I've read the plot online and I've seen scenes from it, and it's not what kind of doesn't make me want to watch it and not prioritize it as something I want to do in my life is it's not just completely different from the book, but it's from what I've heard, just a bad production. <laughs> like it's just a bad film. So and again, might make it kind of delightful and sort of like a drinking game kind of watching, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, Diane, thank you so much. Please tell people where they can find you and all the amazing projects that you're working on right now. Oh, I don't know about amazing, but amazing. <laughs> you, I, I live on Instagram. That's my only social media. So you can find me on Instagram. It's at shape by stories, Diane. Um, and I also occasionally do a podcast where I interview people about books that were meaningful to them as children and, you know, throughout their lives. That's also called Shape by Stories. And Tabby has also been on an episode of that. Um, and then I do have a new project called The Thing About Austin. So you can also find that Instagram account if you are somebody who's very into Jane Austen and a podcast that I do with my friend Zan. And it's just like a deep dive into just things about Austin. I mean, it's it's deeply, deeply nerdy. I cannot even express how nerdy it is. <laughs> it's incredible. It's like, oh, I, I did want to know what umbrellas were made out of back in the Regency <laughs> times. Like, wait a minute. I get so into the episodes. <laughs> yeah, it is like, it's peak nerdery for sure. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Diane. Thank you. Oh, it seems so funny and, and horrible to think of Diana marrying Fred, doesn't it? What is so horrible about it? Well, he certainly isn't the wild, dashing young man Diana used to want to marry. Fred is extremely good. That is exactly what he should be. Would you want to marry a wicked man? Well, I wouldn't marry anyone who was really wicked. But I think I'd like it if he could be wicked and wouldn't. <laughs> 